to everybody, and welcome to Wild Pitches. I'm Mick Gillespie, and I uh, want to remind all you guys to like and subscribe to our Smokies podcast here, Wild Pitches. And uh, we try to do this as much as often, uh, as much as we can, as often as we can. And we're joined by people around the ballpark, and uh, here's uh, Jeremy Bowler to join us. Jeremy, Vice President, right? Isn't that yes, your title? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. I knew that, but I figured I'd let you say. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's a good, a good title. Vice President of Boyd Sports. So you spend uh, part of your time with the Smokies, and then you spend part of your time with uh, the four teams in the Appy League and a fifth one on the way. Yeah, that's correct. So uh, based here out of the Smokies, so Vice President of Boyd Sports right here, live in Knoxville, so uh, make Smoky Stadium home basically. But we own and operate four other baseball teams in the Tri-Cities and the Kingsport Axemen, the Johnson City Doughboys, Elizabeth River Riders, and the Greenville Flyboys. So they take a lot of time as well to make sure we're up and running, constantly doing stadium improvements and rock and roll and getting them as well. Nice. Well, we'll get into that a, a little bit later on the show. But I, I guess we start, like, I'm always curious, and I know that people that uh, that watch or want to know about you guys and how you got here and, and your careers. Where'd you go to college, and then how did you transition from college into professional sports? Well, that there is a story in itself. So, as I usually tell all the college kids when I go speak, so I'll, I'll sum it you up. You speak to college kids? All the time. ETSU, <laughs> University of Tennessee, uh, Gardner-Webb, I went to school. Do you so. have, a, like, some kind of, like, uh, joke or something that you start your conversation with? with? You know, because, you, like, you're always supposed to have something that you, you come in, and you, and you hit them with this, and then... Okay, you turn the okay. microphone weird. No, yeah, you, to an extent, I do. I, I basically tell them, whatever you think you know about sports, it's wrong. <laughs> Especially <laughs> well, what we do. I can't speak for, you know, uh, professional football or something like that. But what we do, uh, I always come in right away and tell them, hey, if you think you're going to get rich right away and you're, not, you're just going to work nine to five, you're, you're wrong. All that stuff can come in time. But right now, you're going to be working, working your tail off, working you know, 60 plus hours a week right out of the gates, especially right out of school. So I tell them that right away, and then I kind of get into my spiel. I think I usually get their attention pretty fast. And I tell the professor, put earmuffs on, because, you know, it's who you know, not what you know sometimes in this mm -hmm. industry. Yeah. So I think but, it's probably a lot of industries, but this one, nepotism's big in this one. Uh, obviously, networking, and uh, you need a, a lot of times you need a sponsor. Yes. As correct. we call it, you know, someone that's going to kind of go to bat for you. Yeah, absolutely. So, so kind of, kind of given the cliff notes of my background. So, I went to Gardner Webb University, a uh, small Division One uh, private school in Western North Carolina. Absolutely loved my time going there. And there it is. So, did no, that. No, I'm there for four years, and really, uh, this is now this one. Is this is actually not a lot of folks know this, but now everyone's going to know this. What got me into sports? What really made me say, "Hey, this is what I want to do for a living." It's Madden football franchise mode. Really? Yes. Uh, the video so, game. The video game. Yeah, yeah, because I was a business administration major, knowing I wanted to work in the business world, but truly didn't know what I wanted to do. And then I, one summer after my sophomore year, taking summer school classes in my apartment there, just playing franchise mode in my downtime, I became pretty darn good. I, I kept winning <laughs> Super Bowl after Super Bowl, my franchise mode, making top free agent picks, all that kind of stuff. And I was like, you know what? The sports thing's pretty cool. I think I might want to be a sports agent or something. Right. This is pretty cool. So that's what kind of opened my eyes to the sports world and the business side of sports world. Obviously, I used to play baseball and different things, but I'm not a I'm not a professional athlete. I'm more on the business side. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where my talents, I would say, probably are. So basically, did that, and then really said, okay, how do I do that? What do I do? So actually, my now wife at the time, girlfriend. She was playing softball at Gardner Webb, and she told me probably should just go down to the athletic department and just see who you can meet down there. Maybe they got a job or something, like an internship. So say or something this like again: that. your your girlfriend was a softball player. At yes, Webb. Adrian, my wife. And now she she's was, your wife. She's my wife. Yeah, we dated. Literally that worked from out good year for you. To, yeah, it worked out. Did great. you go to her games? Are you a big cheerleader? Oh yeah, every game because there they play double headers in the games where you know two two or four o'clock and they go an hour class. too they're yeah, fast yeah yeah you great go out of class go over there and great sport watch softball so yeah i traveled all the games what position too. outfield okay she played does outfield. she play a lot yeah she played a lot for gardner web really okay not to not to digress but i just had to ask about that absolutely yeah so so she told me that so i went down there literally i walked into and i don't know this is still 
some of the bigger schools might be a lot harder to do this. That's why I tell the kids in class. I'm about UT if you can just walk into the AD's office. But at Gardner Webb, I did. I literally just walked in to the athletic direct, athletic office, and there was a receptionist sitting right in front of me. And I said, hi, my name is Jeremy Bowler, and I'm a student here. And I've decided I really want to work in sports. Uh, what can I do? What can I do to help? And it's like, well, we don't have any pay positions right now. You can probably just volunteer doing stuff. I said, sure, I, I will literally do whatever. So I gave them my information, that kind of stuff. And then they literally introduced me to the athletic director and the associate AD. And I walked down the hallway, got to meet everybody. And I said, <laughs> hey, I'm just here to help. Uh, between my downtime and classes and all that kind of jazz, what can I do to help? I just want to get my name out there and I want to see what this whole world of sports is. So that just kind of started that. So I really volunteered my time for over a, probably an entire semester, I would say, semester and a half. Mm -hmm. You know, classes, my class use schedule is usually 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, so they would open at 8. I'd go down there and literally either sit there and do my homework or get ready, yeah. or I would print tickets for them, help, you know, organize stuff. I definitely got the mail. Every day I would go get the mail, and I would love You're it. You like the mail I, guy. I loved it because some people might think it's kind of weird but i liked it because i got a chance to get the mail and at that time too especially in football all the recruits who want to play football are sending in like dvds mm -hmm. of like their highlight films so i would put them in the receivers coach box the defensive backs coach box or whatever they were for the coaches and the mail and then same thing with the other sports too that was always fun to see kind of what really comes through and then uh being at a small school you know you get to play a lot of the big schools sometimes and they pay you to play mm -hmm. so i remember we played a football game against mississippi state and uh, they mailed a check, and our athletic director came to me and said, Jeremy, go take one of the, the four Tauruses out there in the parking lot, the fleet car, go to the business office. This is a Mississippi State football check for a game. They know you're coming, so you go straight there. Like a, mil <laughs> like a million dollars or I something? I think at that time it was probably like 500000 something like okay. that still. But I was like, oh, I've never held this kind of money in my, my hand before. But that was pretty cool. That was really cool. They trusted me to do that. Take the beat down. What was the score in the game? I don't remember. It was uh, actually I think we made it interesting. We definitely did not win. Okay, I'm gonna. But look especially that we up. play uh, like in basketball, we go to Chapel Hill and play them and put up really good numbers. I remember uh, only losing by three points, uh, maybe my junior year or something like that up there. But that was always a lot of fun, you know. And they made me. I would go get all the oils changed in the car, take the cars to the oil change place and just do all that for the coaches' cars. Oh, yeah. So I would just do whatever. I literally was a fly on the wall. What can I do to make a name for myself? I'm a guy willing to do anything. Right. Um, and then they put me one summer, the next summer, they put me in charge as an official unpaid internship, which I was all for. I wanted to work and do it. Uh, I tried to sell advertising. I think that's what really spurred me to this type of world that we live in now. So trying to sell you know football game day program ads is what i was tasked with at the time and i feel like i did pretty good they gave me a phone book and said here you go here's the folks who have bought it before call them and here's a phone book here's a little i had a little closet office i would say that nobody was using so i just hooked me up a phone in there and i felt big time and i started making phone calls and they said hey here's it's summertime you started cold calling like, oh yeah cold call i know what to do i just kind of went with it i was like hey i don't know anybody what do i got to lose here right so Worst thing they're going to tell me is no. I learned that pretty quick. Wow, you know what? I got the score here. What's the score? 31-15. Uh, it, it, it was a rough game, but it was you a good You know what? That's was, actually a lot better than I thought. It was a win for the Gardner Webb Running Bulldogs in, the, in the grand what. scheme of things. Yeah, the big check and um, being on TV, national television. Yeah, wow, okay. A lot of the games are on TV, but not necessarily you know, ESPN, those kind of things. So. But yeah, so I got a chance to do all those kind of things, cold call, and they gave me a Ford Taurus for the summer to go out and, if I got a meeting with somebody, you know, go out there and talk to them and sell some ads. And then actually, I'm not going to lie, I think it did pretty darn good. And I think I sold like $10,000 worth of stuff, which at the time I think was pretty good for us unpaid summer intern sitting there making cold calls right. for a couple hundred bucks of pop ads. And then uh, kind of, I would say, successfully did the football program that year. And then also start moving on, okay, what can I, what else can I do? Can I do baseball, softball, soccer? They all got billboards and places to go. You can sell stuff and all that kind of stuff. So started helping out in the fall, helping sell some other advertising, and then officially did an official internship with the athletic department, of course, all unpaid. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I didn't care. I just wanted to work. And I worked night shifts, everyone knows who. Uh, also, I had to make some money. So I worked the night shift at the local YMCA. Sounds like you uh, walk to school in your bare feet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was like, 15 miles so in the snow. <laughs> yeah, exact. right. Some, some, but look, a lot of people kind of, you know, that, that came up the way that we did. You, you had to do a lot of that stuff if you didn't have an in 
to get the opportunity and also the experience. Yes. So my end, I guess, was uh, Madden football. Got me. Got the, the the seed was planted. Literally, just had had the courage of walk down and say, "Hi, here's my name. What can I do? I'm willing to do anything." And that morphed into internship and bigger roles and literally having a desk every day uh, to be at and all that kind of stuff. So I had a blast. And then, so I guess long story short now, I get too late, too long, but uh, going into what happened next, really what launched my career in this industry was that. So I got a chance when I graduated, I was unemployed for four months. Unemployed, couldn't find a job. I actually get really, really discouraged because I couldn't find a job in sports. You know, and you, I call. I always say this too. I call it the shotgun approach. Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer of emailing your resume and applying to as many jobs as possible. Because if you get 10 percent or less back, that's still something out there. Because if you're if you're gung ho on working right. for one team, that's gonna be hard. Because I'm from Charlotte, and I it was my life's dream at the time. I still would love to one day maybe, but it's my life's dream time to work for the Carolina Panthers, my hometown team. That'd be cool. That was I wanted to get in the NFL. I wanted to, but I didn't know anything about being on the player personnel side, but Madden said otherwise, because I was pretty good at it from the video game. And I realized I wasn't gonna get a job at the Carolina Panthers because I didn't know anybody, like we were somehow, I didn't mm -hmm. have an in. And every time I would apply on their website, I would say, thank you, we'll consider your resume for future applications right your standard uh, no basically yeah oh yeah so I was unemployed for four months and then I got the opportunity after doing all that um, had a basically three job offers in a row one with Gardner Webb working in their alumni slash development office and then one at the at the time the Charlotte Bobcats right doing group sales and then with the Winston Salem Dash okay the single A of the Chicago White Sox they were built a brand new 47 million dollar stadium 2010 uh, 2010, 2011 season, excuse me, yeah. So got a chance, you know, that's what sold me. You go over there for the interview, uh, you did a phone interview, do all that, and you go over there for the actual interview, and you just see, wow, they're building, literally, you get your interviews in a construction helmet, and, you know, that gets you exciting. So my job there, I ended up taking that job, you know, and I wanted to grow my career and get out of home for a little bit, get out of Charlotte, so mm -hmm. got a chance to sell there. My job was to sell high-end assets, so... Not just season tickets, but season tickets to businesses, like all-you-can-eat tickets and high-end club seats, okay. full-season suites for, you know, uh, for corporate, corporate what, businesses. What's your sales technique? Like, when you get someone on the phone, when you feel like you got them on the hook, yeah. how, do you, uh, how do you reel them in? Okay, so my big philosophy, and I learned this working with Winston-Salem because they were owned by Mandalay, or not owned, but they had a partnership with consulting with Mandalay Baseball at the time. Okay. And we had a thing, I think Steve Lay, I think, taught this as well when he was there, um, was Silly Putty Marketing. I always say this, Silly Putty. You can shape it, stretch it, mold it. We can shape, stretch, and mold anything we have to fit your budget and your needs. Yeah. From literally naming the stadium down to bringing a booth out for a night and just meeting people. Mm -hmm. So That's true. That's what I tell folks. We yeah. can literally go anywhere in between. I mean, you're not hurting my feelings. And if, it's, and if it doesn't fit, it's okay. You're not hurting my feelings. We'll get you out to a ball game. And, uh, as, a, as you know, as a as a custom, future customer or bring your family out, just have a good time. It's got to be a good partnership. And it's got to be a fit for both parties. Mm -hmm. That's how I really approach it. And then if it's not a good fit for them, you know, then they're not going to renew next year. So it's got to be a good fit and good fit for us as well. So that's really my philosophy. And, you know, you don't want to go in there and say, guns blazing, you got to have this, you got to buy this. Uh, I don't really know what do they it. want. Do it. Buy know what this. Do it. That's why I ask I ask a lot of questions. I, when we're doing sales, I ask a lot of questions. Okay, who are, are you doing branding? Mm -hmm. Is it more like, I want my name out on a billboard and that's all I want? Or is yeah. it more activation with a booth out and social media, uh, radio? Mm -hmm. what, what is it? Yeah. What, are you looking for more client entertainment with a group outing or the upper level entertainment up in, you know, a, in a private box, in a mm -hmm. suite or an area like a club? So yeah. there's so many different questions. I think once you know that, then we, we custom here at Boyd Sports, we customize everything. So once we know those things, and then what, they, what kind of framework we're working with, you know, what they're looking for, then we can really build stuff. So that's how we really approach it. Silly Putty Marketing to ask a lot of questions. If it works, great. We want to be, make this uh, mm -hmm. turn into a, you know, a long-lasting partnership. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we've got a lot of great partners yeah. here. And with this company, you were in the sales department, and then you kind of went full over to the Appy League, which is kind of its own thing within itself, and now yeah. you're kind of back again helping out with both, so you've been like a ping pong Well, ball. it never really left, technically. Well, so, you know what I mean. Yes, like, yeah, so basically, uh, 
start off with when I, so when I left Winston Salem. Sales with sales. Correct. So when I left Winston Salem, I got a chance to go be the general manager of the Forest City Owls in the Coastal Plain League. And that's a pipeline. I mean, look, I, I, I've yes. some I've run across a lot of these former Owls. They're everywhere. They really <laughs> you guys are. fly all over the place. Our manager in Kingsport, or excuse me, in Johnson City, Kevin Mahoney, is a yeah. former Owl. Rory, so. Rory Tedimer, who's a part of our oh, broadcast yeah. team, is an Owl. Our general manager in Elizabeth is a former Owl. So former we got a bunch. Owl. The pipeline um, runs deep. Shout and, out to Phil. That's right. Phil Daniel, Phil, yep. Owner. So basically, the reason I bring them up is because that's what leapfrogged me to the Smokies and what we're getting into. So I'll just be brief about it, but I was the general manager at 23 years old. I, I didn't Youngest know I was, general manager in the it, history. I feel like in the league at the time, for sure. No, it had to be. I, I'm not going to lie. I probably I didn't know what I was doing. You, you know, Were you, you cocky? Were you like, no, man, I'm a no. GM right now? I, mean, I, I don't think I was. I really <laughs> don't think kidding. so. I try to be humbled, uh -huh. but also I was definitely a willing bit, to uh, listen. Yeah. Now, at the end of the day, I was the general manager, but it was my decision. Also right, things. right, right. But I was definitely willing to listen and learn from our manager that had been there, won back-to-back -back championships, and learn from our uh, assistant GM and staff that was there who were much older than me at the time. I, I needed to learn and listen to what they were doing and you know, learn my own path as well. Not just from doing sales at that point, but learning everything. Yeah, and let me, let me say this, yeah. too, for those that are like, okay, four city outs. It's the same as the Appy League, where it's college kids that come when the season's over. So, you know, locally, the University of Tennessee's uh, an excellent baseball program, and they'll send a lot of those guys across the country to play for different teams. And um, and then, you know, the the operations are run like minor league operations. It's a condensed season, but it's in smaller markets, and right. the, you know, it's the minor league team for those markets in a lot of places. I worked for the Wilson Tobbs, you know, back in the 60s and 70s and 80s. It was a minor league oh, style. Minor league parks. You know, and it had a really cool old minor league park, Fleming Stadium. And then that's the only way they could keep baseball in it. And, it, and as baseball contracts minor league teams, which is going to continue to happen, um, which is, I guess, a topic for another day or something we could talk about. But um, I, I see the footprint of major league baseball contracting minor league teams. That's kind of a way to you know, to have some sort of baseball. Yeah, I mean, just so fo in case folks in our audience here doesn't know, the summer collegiate baseball, I, I, it plays, I personally believe, and I know it's true too from talking to athletes and folks in Major League Baseball, it's very important. It plays a very big role because you got a lot of college athletes who, maybe in today's world might be a little bit different. They play more wood bats more now than ever, but before they never played wood bats, but the metal bats, now it's a, kind of a metal composite bat, but still, there's a very big difference from that metal bat, you know, for the most part, to mm -hmm. the wooden bat and how they play at a nighttime setting and a big setting. Uh, so scouts want to see that. They want to see we play with a, a different, you know, we play with the MLB ball. We play with wood bats. Uh, we got scouts. We got technology. And a lot, yes, a lot of the bigger schools, like UT, your SEC, ACC schools, all your big Power Five schools, yeah, they've got the pitch clock mm -hmm. and all those kind of things too, and technology. There's a lot of schools who don't. So, but they, but they have great talent. Yeah. And so this is a chance for them to be seen, and where they may have not been seen as much at the school they were in, but now they get a chance and they're on the spotlight, and really, really get a chance to make a name for themselves. I'll, I'll give a shout out right now. Nate Anderson, last year, played in Kingsport from Gardner-Webb University, I'm alma mater. I'm obviously a little biased, but the, the stats don't lie. He, he had an amazing summer because, you know, he was not an everyday starter at Gardner-Webb, and then he came here and basically worked his way into the starting lineup mm -hmm. in Kingsport and became an all-star, and we did the Appalachian League Pro Day at the Charlotte Knight Stadium where scouts were there, and they did all these different things. And they did a, um, a dash test, and he was the fastest kid in the Appalachian League. He was the fastest uh, fielder, I should say, in the Appalachian League. And so now, as far as I know, he's an everyday starter for Gardner-Webb just because he got a chance to play every day and really work on his craft. So a lot of guys, if they get hurt, they need rehabs, they need all these different things, it's a, it's a great way for them to get a lot of innings, especially hitters yeah. who definitely need more innings, who didn't get a chance to play as much or got hurt or freshmen. So the Appalachian League really focuses on freshmen and sophomores in particular who maybe didn't get a chance to start every single day, but they have bright futures with their program. Right. Now they get to come here and be a starter every day. And this is what professional baseball is going to be like. You're not just playing Tuesdays and then Friday, Saturday, Sundays. Right. You're playing every day of the entire yeah, week. It's a good, it really is a good taste of what pro ball is yes. like. And there's a guy on the Smokies, Hayden McGarry, who's their first baseman. Um, who was in that league 
last year, and he did a great job before he was drafted in the 15th round, and he can really hit, you know. Um, and so as you watch him develop and, and everything else in double A, it, it, it's crazy to think that he was in that league last year. MVP of the league. I mean, this is the guy that's in double A right now who literally in July of last year was at an all-star game and then became in August became the MVP of the league. And now he's in double-A baseball. That's pretty fast, first off. Uh, so kudos to him. He's doing a great job. And I know that's what it's about. That's though, what right? it's about. That's a, so right now it looks like the league is working. All those guys are getting experience, and uh, the Cubs thought they liked when they when they drafted him, and he's, he's putting the work in right now. He's doing great. So he's a good, proud alumni of the Appalachian League right now. Let's talk about the new stadium a little bit. I mean, yeah. we're, you know, less than two years away from a new home. Um, I still like being here, so it's not like we're running from this facility like Chattanooga, you know, where their their ballparks basically deteriorated to the part. The, and I used to work there. Look, I'm not putting them down. I'm just saying it, that place is falling apart. Um, but this is going to be great to move downtown. Mm -hmm. Have you been involved in that at all? And your thoughts on uh, stadium and Old City? I'm, I'm very excited about it. The Old City is a fantastic area of downtown in Knoxville in general. I mean, over is 70... that close to where you live? Yeah, actually, yeah, so, that's what I thought. I, mean, yeah. but I, I live in East Knoxville, so I mean, I can get literally to the new downtown site less than 15 minutes. I can get here, in, you know, 20 minutes or so. So I, I'm fine either way. But I love downtown. I love Knox. I live in Knoxville, so. A lot of the stuff we do on the weekends, we have three kids, the family, it's all going to typically West Knoxville in particular, where a lot of things are. Uh, so that's our stomping grounds. But my wife and I, we love to go out, we go downtown, go to the old city right. all the time. So this will be, I think, a very nice, great addition to downtown. Mm -hmm. And a great addition for the Smokies and the Chicago Cubs. I mean, over 70% of our fan base comes from Knox County. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think a yeah. lot of folks know that. No, and we didn't. I mean, we actually surveyed that for years mm -hmm. to get, you know, kind of figure out what zip code everybody had, and it was pretty much Knoxville. It's Knoxville. The Fountain City area is by far number one. Then it really? goes like the Farragut and Hardin Valley. I took, uh, I took the Biscuits broadcaster, Chris Adamswall, to Linton's yesterday. Oh, good choice. Fountain City. Yeah. Um, Look, they're not a sponsor here, but our, on the podcast, you know, we can kind of talk about how good that place was. It's very good. We Fantastic. did the. Um, have you ever done this before? I've, I've actually pulled this off with um, Chris Allen, the team president, on many occasions. But one person orders one thing, and then the other person orders another, and then you split and do a trade. I have not done that. Black. It was no. a uh, blockbuster trade. Uh, I got the the uh, grilled um, chicken salad sandwich, Ooh. and he got. Uh, this burger that had pimento cheese and other stuff on it. Oh, a solid choice. Okay. I made, I, I, and I gave him half of mine on his request, and he gave me half of his. And it turned out to be as much as I like the chicken salad, sa the chicken salad there, and the chicken salad sandwich. Uh, a great deal for me. The, the hamburger was unbelievable. Sounds like one of our fans' football trades, blockbuster. Yeah. That's a good trade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. and a good good transition. But yeah, check out Linton's if you're in Fountain City. Yeah, so the, not, the new stadium, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be so exciting. We'll be there in a April of 2025. Yeah, it's, it's weird kind of just thinking like, you know, that there's going to be a new place. You know, it, you know, it's like I come in here and, and I've come in here for so long and been here, you know, I think the third longest guy now. Uh, You're on, a savvy veteran now. Yeah, I mean, like, and I still like coming here, you know, and I, I think part of that is the – comfort that I have with the stadium, but also um, we have a great front office. I mean, we have a we lot do. of fun. You know, you, you wanted to get into fantasy football. Uh, I won the championship last year, and you won it the year before. I, I did, yeah. I'm not going to lie. Back-to-back -back winners right here. Back-to-back -back winners. Uh, it's so competitive. It, it, okay. We have one of the most competitive fantasy football leagues I've ever heard of. So just everyone's out there. We draft. Uh, we, we can trade draft picks. So that's mm. really what I think yeah. drives at it to make it really interesting. So, by the way, why is your trophy sitting over there on top of a cubicle and not in your office? I know, because we're going to do a presentation. i got to have uh, my, my guy Terrence Ware, who's uh, okay, yep. not only my insurance agent and not only a sponsor of the radio broadcast, but he's also the GM of my team. So we got to do it together. Okay. So we've had – Fair enough. That's been, to me – the most fun of the whole thing is us getting together, Terrence and I, and <laughs> talking over everything and making decisions, you know, based on, like, kind of what's going on with this. Yeah, he's got football. his own scouting department and everything <laughs> over here for his fantasy football team. Yeah, we got robbed in 2018. <laughs> and so it, so last year we, we actually uh, caught a big break in the, the second round of the playoffs 
really should have lost to Tim. He had uh, uh, the Chargers quarterback and running back, and the quarterback scored less than seven points. And if he'd have got seven, we'd have lost, you know. So Eckler and uh, what was the, what's the quarterback? Herbert. Herbert, yeah. So. so with that being said, just for the folks know out there, we get two keepers in our league, a third-round mm-hmm. keeper and a sixth-round keeper. Who are you keeping, Nick, if anybody? I never keep anybody. Okay, I mean, it unless it's someone like that I really, really like, um, I normally throw them all back. I, I, last year, I, I kept Cam Akers, and yeah. he you know, got in trouble with the team and didn't play. And then the crazy thing about it is at the end of the season, I'd released him. Uh, after a, a, a lot of debate, and, and he started to play like we thought he was going to play. And then he had a big game against us, back-to-back yeah. weeks, because Eris had him. And Eris, I played Eris the last week of the season, and he beat me, so I didn't get a bye. So then I had to play him again in the playoffs. And Tough break. And, and, yeah. And, and, yeah, and if Eckler, or if um, uh, Akers would have had a better game, if he'd have touched the ball a little bit more, you know, I might have lost. So it was it was crazy watching that game and going, man, this guy I had him. I, he's the only <laughs> keeper, and then now he's going to beat me. But you yeah. never know in the world of fantasy football yeah. really what's going to happen. That's yeah, what makes it's, it, fun. it is it is so competitive, and there's a lot of smack talk. With a lot of it. smack talking, by far. Big yeah, time. We, that's what makes it interesting. I made a trade with you to help you get to the championship, but then it helped me because I had the draft. I think picks I traded you some guys back this year to help you out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I. I made a trade with you right at the deadline just because I didn't want someone else to get those players. That's right. Thank you. And, you know, it's kind of like <laughs> I could sell them to the next guy he's going to play, or I can sell he's just got to overpay to get yeah. these guys, you yeah. know. So it's kind of how it really works in the real world. I so, knew I knew yeah. that we were close, and I was like, ah, I'm just going to take these two guys. I didn't even play them. So for our well, audience I, here, so maybe I did. We the way our league works again is you know you can trade draft picks. Really, once you kind of know in our mm-hmm. league, you're out of the you're out of the playoff run. Hey, let's you start. We're, we're selling off. It's almost like real sports. Uh, we're selling off to our to gather draft pick capital and get more first and second round, third round picks, and or keeper players. And then next thing you know, these juggernaut teams arise. The last four <laughs> teams of the year are like super teams because they've huh. wiped out everybody else's team of everything they got. Then they just kind of battle it out. So. And then those teams uh, will stink again next year because you have no draft picks. I know. Uh, a lot of folks have no draft picks. I'm Usually wondering. it's a curse. If you win the championship, you pretty much gave up the future. You mortgage the future to win. And so now people like myself that are at the bottom, I'm uh, looking pretty good in the top three picks, yeah, I think, this year. Not me. I'm not, but you know what? Somebody's going to just surprise everyone. And they do. Every year. Pull it off with, you know, you, basically you'll go into the draft and you might have like a fifth round pick. I mean, like it's, you know, like I think I, I'm not going to have many picks this year. So. Well, just say this, Brian Cox, former general manager of the Smokies. Yeah, he did a good job. He always, big Browns fan, Cleveland Browns fan, always just drafted Browns players or UT players, mm-hmm. never made a single trade the entire year, no. wins back-to-back championships. I don't know how he did it. I don't know how he did the magic. He did. He, he, he won in 2018 because Thomas Capel, who used to work <laughs> here, uh, yeah. seated the draft wrong. And It's controversial. But that's, uh, I don't even want to talk about that. <laughs> All right, well, let's we'll switch gears. Then, yeah, let's right? let's uh, change gears and um, talk about your favorite ballpark food. You know, you've been around Ooh, ballparks yeah. for a long mm-hmm. time. Uh, you know, I, I love eating ballpark food because when when I first got into business, it was you know it was just like regular hot dog and you know like regular pizza and 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 regular hamburger. And we've gone gourmet, man. I mean, yeah. like you know, we're kind of taking it to the next level. Yeah. I really, I don't know. I don't know if it's a favorite, but you're right. The hot dogs, you can try different ones, foot long dogs, or different, you know, whatever. But I, I don't know. I've kind of really gotten into a lot of the ballparks now are doing different types of Southwest style food. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, yeah. It would be wraps or some sort of you know, ballpark quesadilla yeah. or something like that. Uh, or like here, the Taste of Chicago, uh, you know, get a Chicago dog. Try a different, like you go to a spring training, that kind of stuff, or get a you know, Chicago-style pizza somewhere, or whatever it may be. So we do a lot of ballpark tours. A lot of folks don't know this, but when we knew, you know, we started the phase of the construction, you right. know, or designing the stadium. We have visited about 25-plus stadiums. Had to look around. Look around. And when you're there, you got to try out the ballpark fair, and you're there. There's been some great food uh, over the years. So I don't know. I think lately right now, more like the Southwest style. Boneless wings are a big thing now, or, or other oh, yeah. kinds of wings too. But uh, I don't know. That's what I would kind of go with right now. Uh, tip tonight is uh, they bring in food for the front office too. We do, and uh, it is um, 
I didn't see who it was tonight. Cheesecake Factory. Oh, we're going to crush it. That is. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, that's a good night. We, we cater in. Yeah. Uh, we work out deals with a lot of our local restaurants yeah. here to cater in food for all of our full-time staff and interns. Uh because everyone's working here all day, might as well got to feed them. So, well, where, if you and the wife go out to dinner, where do you guys go? Where are your spots? Okay, well, Cheesecake Factory is a good one. Really? Uh, do you go there? Yeah, we go there. For real? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, if it's a special occasion like our anniversary or anything, we go to Melting Pot. Uh, oh, Adrian loves yeah, yeah. Melting Pot. Like, the, do you Love take it. the kids or is this no, just the two of you? Just the two of Who's us. Who's your babysitter? Uh, either my mom or oh, nice. or we get a baby. You're set up. Yeah. You're set up. Yes. Well, you've got three. Do you feel like when Tim nudged ahead with his fourth <laughs> kid? Uh, Tim Volk, all of a sudden, do you guys kind of get that competitive urge at home? No, I don't think so. I think we're good now with three. So <laughs> when you got four, I was like, good luck. Dude. Yeah, it's a small, it becomes a small army. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, got an army now. Okay, so, so Melting Pot and Cheesecake Factory, anywhere else? Oh, gosh. I love, I, I'm a big fan of uh, a number of different breweries in town. The Yeehaw Place is the new brewery. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I haven't been to the new one, though. It's I great. love craft beers. You know that. I got a it's, beer. Cra you were on the show. You were on the Yeah, craft yeah. No, we'll do bridge, another one of those. A Bridge Brewing has their location really? in Bearden, but they have a brand new location out in West Knoxville, the old K Town Taverns, where yeah. it's at. So they have great beer, great food. Really? Uh, great burgers. Their burgers are fantastic, and they're not a sponsor of us. I'm just no, no. Just calling like well, what right I'm now. thinking it's is great. like you know, just kind of selfishly, I'm like maybe I'll meet you at one of these places because I've Should become you? a big fan of. I think Zool's the best oh, beer Zool's in great, town. Great right? stuff. And um, you know, one's called Crafty Bastard. That's what it's called. Yep. Pretty good beer there. Good beer. There's a this town has the Knoxville area has become kind of a craft beer place. I mean, it's not quite Asheville, North Carolina, but it's getting there. It is. It really is. There's so many craft breweries, not just here, but like all the way from here to Johnson City. There's so many breweries uh, coming down through here now. And they're popping up all the time. It's great yeah. stuff. But definitely check some of them out. They're great. Uh, all right, well, let's talk expansion in baseball because okay. I think that Major League Baseball, I know, look, the, the commissioner, uh, Rob Manfred, has said he wants to expand. They want to add teams. I, I, they want to add two teams. It gets them to an even number. They found a spot for the Oakland A's in Las Vegas. Now they're going to tear down the Tropicana. And uh, which is a historically uh, really famous hotel on the strip, but they're going to put the baseball stadium and then have a hotel yeah. as part of that, which will be awesome. Uh, the A's will no longer be the poorest team in the league that's and right. playing in the worst stadium that's out there. Um, and then the next one's Tampa Bay, and I'm feeling like they're going to end up in Orlando. Uh, yeah, that as it looks. came about. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, recently. Yeah, hmm. well, it all comes down to a stadium. And Orlando's close enough to Tampa Bay where, you you know, look, you could make it work. I mean, the, the yes. same fan base can go both places. Florida's kind of that way where maybe they're not as loyal to, hey, I'm in Tampa. You know, you know you're know, you really in, you know, this area, and it's near Tampa. It's just, but you can just as easily get to uh, Orlando. Right. And then after that, they're going to expand. So um, Salt Lake City is an interesting market. Uh, Montreal used to have a team. They sure want another did. team. But I, I think baseball's got to look. Nashville first. And then uh, if Nashville gets a team, I think that eliminates Charlotte. But they would love to have a team. And I know your heart's in Charlotte. It is. Who, who, where would you rather see, Nashville or Charlotte? I mean, I'm putting you on the spot right I now. I think Nashville would have immediate success. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they both wouldn't, but Nashville gets so many, like the downtown right now. I mean, it, it's just it's booming. And with the new MLS team they have there, I, I just think from not just – Folks in the region like Knoxville would travel. Well, they like there. hockey. And and, and yeah, yeah. There's no, you, that doesn't even snow here that much. And I mean, then they, very rarely. Like, their downtown is, has a. I don't want to say tourist, but like the bachelorette capital oh, yeah. of the South. It's got so many people coming and going out of there. I definitely think. Not saying Charlotte doesn't, but I would definitely think they would have a ton of success immediately. Uh, Tennessee in general loves sports. I think that would be a no-brainer. And they have the, the financial backing, I believe, of the state and the city, and they have the support. I don't know about that from the other cities, but I think I think that would be a no-brainer. Obviously, I love the Charlotte Knights. And same thing with the National Sounds. Uh, same thing with the Las Vegas team. There's a minor league baseball team in all these markets. Uh, I don't know if you can keep both. I'm sure you can, but they got to work out those details of how that would work. But... I would say I think I would think Nashville right now. That's what I would say. Yeah, I think baseball has been so slow in recognizing the shifting landscape of our country. 
And there's places that have teams like Oakland that should have been out of there a long time ago. Agreed. You know, yes. the, the, the stadium doesn't work. Um, they, they don't make enough money. They don't have a big enough fan base. And NFL got out, and the NBA moved across the bay to San Francisco, and baseball is always last to react. It always feels like that. Nashville is one of the best markets, and it's one of the best cities, if not the best city in our country. And I'm looking at the Titans that do well. I'm looking at the Predators, which it's crazy to think that the Predators. Oh, they do great. But the, everyone yeah. loves the Predators. It's not, I mean, no, people don't even know the rules of hockey and they like the Predators. Yeah. They don't even play you know, hockey they got a here. professional MLS team and they're, killed, they're doing great. But you look mm -hmm. at the rosters of the teams in the Southern League and, you know, in the SEC, so many great baseball players come out of either the Memphis area or the Nashville area. Oh, yes. Other places across the state. It's a baseball state. Knoxville's a baseball city, you know, which is which is really crazy to say, but it, it really has developed into that between UT and the Smokies. N Nashville should have should have had a team years ago. They should they should have already had one. So I, I'm I think that it's going to happen sometime soon. And when I heard Buster only saying that uh, a couple years on a radio show, I was like, you know what, this is happening. I mean, like th those kind of guys aren't just like shooting off the hip like we're doing right now they there's a reason why they think that there's going to be a team there yes yeah i mean they already so far which may not mean much to a lot of folks but they've already developed an ownership group uh with financial backing and some heavy hitters you got justin timberlake part of that group really tony lasor is part of that group so you got a lot of folks part of that group they may be minority partners but they're in that group they're part of it they're part of it so and they've already got the site planned out and all that kind of stuff and as far as i know they got you know, everyone in the city, you know, something's like a good idea. Now, how do you move forward whenever MLB decides, okay, it's time? Which I know, we both know, it's been waiting for the A's in Tampa to figure out the stadium situations. And it sounds like they're finally. What's the deadline? They're now? finally at third base, getting ready to score. It sounds yeah, like with the deadline yeah. coming up. Yeah, and 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 look, I've been critical of Major League Baseball since Bud Selig left, and I'm not always happy with the way that things are done by Rob Manfred. But I got to give him a lot of credit. He's had a, a bunch of big wins here. And uh, I think it was a huge win to finally get Oakland to say, hey, you know what? We got we got to move and become Las Vegas, you know? And, I agree. I guess it's going to be the A's. But I was just so yeah. sick of the the state and the city and, and just continuing to kind of eh, not commit. And either want or you the don't fingers. want it. Yeah, either do it or don't do it. Um, and, and the, you know, Tampa, same thing. Look, you either get the team or don't. You know, right. I would love to see the Rays become the, you know, Nashville music or whatever they would call themselves um, and us have a team here in the volunteer state. All right, let me change the subject. It's an arms race, so they got to have yep. new facilities. They do. And, I mean, we, we run in that here, and that's Absolutely. why the Smokies are moving. I mean, if you want to keep – a, a major league affiliate baseball team you've got to have the facilities to do it um i you got to tip your cap to randy boyd he's one of the best in the business and he made changes to this stadium before they even asked he just did it because he's got five pillars uh, he talks about it all the time of uh you know of the of the five pillars that make up the business and the players are one of them and he's really honored that the Absolutely. cubs and the players and and taking advantage of uh, of our success and giving it to them. You know, they have a first-class facility here to hit in. When the weather's bad, they've got great locker rooms. And, um, you know, but that stuff's got to continue to get better. And now across the board, it's it's something that um, Major League Baseball really mandates. So, right. you know, the new facility downtown will have uh, even better than what we have here. All right, 2020, we didn't have a season. And that was disappointing. Dark I didn't know times. what I was going to do, man. I mean, like... You know, first time I've ever been on unemployment, and I moved from uh, Knoxville, you know, I lived in the Carnes area, to Fairhope, down on the beach. I had to get out of here. I did just not nothing against here, but it was just that I lived in an apartment, and I was just, you know, watching. You spread your wings now. Yeah, I was yeah. watching my... Uh, you know, all my year, my life's work just did, just go up and smoke, and I, that's a conversation for another day. But still a great move. is awesome. Get to come here, and then I get to live down there. One thing that I did, though, during that time was, um, because I had a lot of time that I normally didn't have, is I started to look into 
uh, you know, the the origins of extraterrestrial life. You know, Ooh. I just got interested in this. You know, so We're I started here. to I yeah that. look and 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 one of I, I remember back in the '80s there was a guy named Bob Lazar who uh, was a nuclear physicist uh, that worked for uh, our our government and um, and eventually he they were wiretapping his phone his wife was leaving him they put him on suspension he thought they might kill him because he his job was to reverse engineer alien spacecraft according to him right and he said they had you know 10 different models and the basically the the way that this thing worked was it was able to, with an element that we didn't have at the time, element 115, which yeah. ironically is now on the empirical chart. Years it, it, later, it's amazing, isn't it? Uh, it? It actually is able to take uh, gravity and, and bend it. And, and the ship, it basically moves because of... Like a wormhole? Well, right? it, it, it's, it's, what he said was it's like if you took a bowling ball and you had it on a bed, and then you pushed down on the bed and created right. a void, the bowling ball falls falls into the void. Okay. And then the element 115, there's two types of gravity. There's the gravity that, that drops things, right? And then there's the gravity that each like element has that keeps itself together. Well, this particular nuclear element, 115, has not only that, that gravity field, but it is extends past the actual okay you know the surface yeah. and that the extraterrestrials he said uh, discovered a way to magnify that and that's how these ships work and, and a couple of guys he said died trying to basically take apart the the reactor that they had on this ship and uh, and I got intrigued by it, and then you watch the videos that the government released and the, you know you see the you know the uh, Navy basically, you know, chasing these things, and then all of a sudden they go 8,000 miles an hour, yeah. literally, yeah, that's crazy. and disappear, and they're different shapes. And there's been a bunch of different videos out of different encounters with uh, with UFOs. And I know you're into this too. So I figured I'd kind of get your take. Yeah, I'm on glad this. we talked about this. Uh, it's very interesting. You're right. Uh, you know, there's the show on History Channel, The Ancient Aliens, and different other things. And big fan of the Skinwalker Ranch show as well, which they're trying to see if there's a some sort of portal or something like that as well above the ranch out there. Yeah, that's it's been a, interesting. It's I been mean, a great something, show. Something's Man. going on something's out there. Something's definitely that's going on. An entirely different topic, but um, but yeah, I mean, if you want to watch that, Ancient Aliens is a good one. Uh, Hangar, is it Hangar One? That's a that's like kind of like an oh, entry yes. level UFO it. show that kind of gets you an idea of like a lot of the rumors and stories and and you hear. From, you know about Bob Lazar and Phil Snyder, um, and the stories of Roswell, which I believe in. I mean, the, the think that we went from a phone that sat on the wall when I was a kid, and you t took your finger and turned it, to more technology than was on the spaceship almost overnight. Yeah, right. I mean, we, like this is what I tell people all the time. Okay, for I don't know thousands of years, um, you went to the bathroom outside, right? And you rode a horse and buggy, and now all of a sudden, like we have this, you know, like yep. it, it just doesn't. The, the technology really just does. You, there's never been a time where it's gone like this. You it's know? always been a slagual, very, yeah. very gradual, or it, backwards, with, like the Middle Ages with lost knowledge. Yep, but yep, yep. I, I would say too, you know, <coughs> I, th I don't. I was telling Mick this earlier too. I don't think there's a coincidence. Yes, there. There's a lot of things with considerably from the ancient times, cave paintings, you know, or, or literally paintings you see with things in the sky. Well, even things in the but Bible, and you'll the look Bible and, talks and, and about certain things. Yeah, and then you'll see like a, you know, like a ship up in the up in the side corner in the sky, and you're like, what is that? You know? But certain things, I don't think it's a coincidence that ever since the end of World War II, when Roswell happened, and you know, right. diff, different technology, because back then, if everyone remembers. The nuclear bomb happened. We were in an arms race at that time with Germany and obviously Russia, and you know, trying to with technology. And don't forget, a lot of folks may not know this, but the German, the Nazis, invented the jet engine mm -hmm. and a lot of other Wonder Waffer weapons, Wonder weapons that we probably still don't know what exist today. I think a now. I'm not saying there's not well, aliens. Well, there's a lot of technology that I think they were that 
probably a lot of stuff could be misidentified for technology we're doing. Well, let me say this. The, the, the story's always been that they had their Roswell in the 20s. True. Yeah, you're right. And that they found a, you know, that, that they had captured a, a, a spacecraft. The Bell Project was right, part of that. Right, and that kind of launched the Bell Project. And then, you know, we had Roswell in 47, which people, before they died, came out and said, look, there were bodies there. there it was an alien spacecraft. And, you know, just like the newspaper story said at first, uh, I, I just can't imagine this being the only spot in the entire universe with intelligent, intelligent life. life it just makes no yeah. sense i mean you look up there and there's and, and there's you know stars and galaxies and, and and it goes on and on and on and on and um you know maybe we're on the far reaches of of you know the galaxy but i'll tell you man like there's just got to be more out there, there it I, makes it just it, it would defy logic to think that there wasn't true very true absolutely i, I can't deny that. And I think once you get past that, too, that, hey, you know, for, for so long, if you said, hey, I think I saw a, a UFO or I saw something, and, and then people would be like, oh, you're crazy. You know, you get past that. There's been stories of people being abducted by aliens for a long time with a lot of credi credible evidence. And, um, you know, there's been sightings for a long time, and then there's stories about, you know, UFO crashes like Roswell. Bob Lazar said that the ship that he reversed engineered, and I, I'd love to hear what you think on this, that geologists found it. And I just have, like... They found the ship? Yeah, geologists. That the ship had quartz on it because it had been underground so long. It's probably what's happening. That's crazy. Walker, that is crazy. <laughs> Isn't that nuts? To yeah. Think about? That's like Skinwalker Ranch. They think there's something there in that mesa on the edge of the of the edge of the ranch. There, there's scientifically there is something there. Uh, I hope they find out what right. it is. But yeah, I, yeah. I, there's no telling what happened long ago uh, from different things with like teleportation. Could, or or another crazy theory is it could be us from the future. We found a way to time travel. Back. Yeah, who knows? So let well, me ask you this: uh, like, what would happen if Tonight on the news, you know, they're like, hey, you're not going to believe this. A you know, spacecraft landed, and these guys came off, and there they are. I would wonder, maybe this is why the government wants to keep everything a secret, uh, if the world economy could very well collapse. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Yeah. Uh, uh, at that point, especially if something bad were to happen, there'd be no more rule of law for government or anything. It'd be everyone... Defenses, defense. I, I don't know. That's uh, a good question. I, I do question how the world economics might work. And and I and I agree in in a way where I say, you know what? There's no telling how the world would react. I mean, COVID happened, and I remember watching everyone buying toilet paper in Asia, you know, and like I don't know Taiwan, and and then it gets here, and everybody bought toilet paper. We didn't even need to. We didn't need to make a run on toilet paper, but we did. Why did we do it? Because the media told us to. <laughs> right. Like, why? I mean, it's like, so I, I, and I thought about that because, I, you know, during that time of not working, I spent, you know, hours researching and reading and watching, and, and, and then all of a sudden our government released, which I thought was, you know, really crazy, but the government released the videos of the UFOs that they encountered, or UAPs now they call them, because mm -hmm. these ships that they've seen, uh, not only do they go 8,000 miles an hour, but they actually go underwater. Yep. And USS. Um, it, yeah, and they go, you know, and they go in the sky, and they're fast, and um, they're, they seem to like to be over top of, of uh, you know, nuclear power plants and subs and stuff like that, nuclear subs. And, um, you know, you see that. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, Bob Lazar had talked about what he did and how the technology worked on the ship that he was trying to reverse engineer. And then ironically, Naval Aviation patented that exact technology <laughs> during COVID. Uh, oh, okay. Do you remember that? No, yeah. not that. No. And then and that, so that happened. And, and then, you know, like they were supposed to release all of the information that they had as part of the COVID package. 
And then, you know, we had a change in the leadership. and You know more about we, this than I do at this yeah, point. Yeah, they, we, I, we didn't get a lot of the information that we thought we were going to get, or maybe we did. I don't know. But it seems like the information that was coming out has kind of slowed oh, yeah, I, uh, from the government. But they have admitted that, you know, that those videos are real. And they said they don't know what they are. You know, if, if they were reverse engineering these ships in the 80s, have they still not fig figured out how they work? Or are they the ones? Or, you know, is oh, that like our know. people that are like zipping or, around 8,000 miles that's an hour? That's exactly right. Or is it the giant, the best conspiracy, conspiracy theory out there that there is no UFOs? That's all us. And what is the best way to hide technology from your adversaries? We don't have that technology. Mm -hmm. You invent the UFO phenomena to protect yourselves. And to make it, make your adversaries think you don't have that technology, but we sure as sure as heck do. Yeah. So I don't know. That's just not, I, that's a, I saw that on the History Channel one time. Yeah. So, oh, that's pretty pretty interesting thought there. Yeah. I, I think that what bothers me the most is just the nature of mankind as a species. You know, like I think we we have encountered aliens and we have the technology. We're learning how to use it. Maybe they gave it to us. Maybe we just. You know, with the ships that they, and this is another thing that was, you know, was kind of written about during COVID too, is that some of the ships that they found, they actually gave to uh, private companies and, and then let them figure out, you know, how to basically reverse engineer the stuff that they found. And then, okay. you know, we got like night vision from that and. And, and other stuff, and people that don't, and I've talked to people and they have no idea about any of this, right? And they're like, what are you talking about? No, I'm being serious. Like, uh, radar systems and, and a bunch of other stuff that came from, you know, private companies that got, you know, were, were given this stuff, you know, different skins for spacecraft, including stealth fighters, and, and I mean, and the list goes on, and, and they got it from the government who found it, you know? Uh, well, between that and, 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 you know. and But instead of using this stuff, to better mankind, we use it to kill each other. For militarization. Yeah, and, and that's, and, and you know, that's the problem with where we are just as a, as a species, and I'm not saying that all of us are, are that way, but that's, that's the problem. You know, we obviously have an issue with fossil fuels. Wouldn't it be great if we were using that to try to figure out what the next way to move around and to produce sure. would be? But no, we're, we're going to figure out how to you know, build Weaponize a nuclear, nuclear bomb, right? And the thing about, the, you, you brought this up, and this is something to ponder on the whole subject here, is, okay, so you're telling me, my, I, I lived with my grandparents, I actually lived with my great-grandmother and my grandmother at different times, right? My great-grandmother used to sit on the front porch with her grandfather, who fought in Gettysburg in the Civil War. Ooh. Now think about that. Okay. And then um, my, my grandmother... Uh, when she was a kid, they didn't have a car because there were no cars. It, it, she rode a horse and buggy. Okay. okay. So that's in, you know, she's telling me that in her lifetime, which 100 years, you know. And, and then all of a sudden, like in the 40s, where they just barely had cars, right, all of a sudden they just figure out how to make this nuclear bomb by splitting atoms. It doesn't make sense when it comes to, like, the technology of the day the at all like it makes boom. no sense right i mean you go from from you know outhouses and you barely have light bulbs and and you know you, you you've seen a model t before oh yeah. yeah and then all of a sudden you've got the technology to destroy city blocks by splitting atoms i mean it, like it, it's it's nuts to me to think it that. is but the same i agree with everything you're saying but at the same time i watch a lot of the history channels my favorite channel and you see, like, the men who built America, the companies that built America, mm -hmm. you know, watching how they build from nothing an assembly line, you know, and how all of a sudden we can manufacture cars at a at speed compared to what they used to do. Right. And then they get into, all, you take that technology and go into toys and food and food. Uh, the Food that built America is a great food. show. You should watch that show, I'm Food starving. that built America. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> it's just amazing. So, uh, at the same time, I think it's a lot of, and I think it's what America is great with. We gave everyone the freedom to come over here right. and make these ideas and turn them into patents, turn them into companies. And their hard labor went into something. They got an invention and make companies. A lot of these major companies came from folks from other countries. And, and I think that's where all in that time period, though, in the 30s and the 20, 20s, 30s, and 40s, 
So I, maybe it's maybe it's America. Maybe it's the the freedom yeah. we had to go over here and they could that we had do all that and had the technology, the money, the financing, mm-hmm. and the land, uh, the workforce at the same time. Uh, like I was watching a, a documentary the other day on the History Channel about the Hoover Dam. And yes, it was right during the Great Depression, the amount of forced labor to build something that had never, ever been built that big before, mm-hmm. uh, which they're obviously very concerned about, which is amazing. It's an amazing feat of uh, human ingenuity and skill and de- de- determination. But at the same time, you're 100% correct. On the other, yes, the labor force went up with the technology. Uh, I do think, like you said, you mentioned the Germans and they had their, uh, their 1920 Roswell. I don't think it's a coincidence at all that after World War II, there's all of a sudden a giant spike in technology. Oh, yeah, Project Paperclip. We went and got all of their scientists. Look, my biggest problem with college, and I got a degree from Alabama. I went to Maryland before that, University of Maryland. The biggest problem that I had with college was the professors that basically hated the country so much in a lot of the classes because... This is the greatest country that was ever assembled. Not perfect, but a great country, you know? And you're right. I mean, all of the things that were accomplished were accomplished because of the freedom that we had. And I hope That's that right. that doesn't change. You know, sometimes I question that these days. But a lot of men God bless this country, man. To yeah. make sure we can sit here and do this podcast I, today. I so. want to show you these right here. I'm going to show, pull oh, these, these boys up. Look at these right here. I got these. Where did you get those? I'm on online. These are my new Brooks USA editions. America. Boom! Look at that. That's a, that just screams America I shoe know, right there. I know. Well, Brooks, I, I wanted a, uh, I, I, you know, I was kind of looking for an American this made shoe. This segment sponsored by. <laughs> American made shoe that was comfortable for running and light. American made? I like that. Yeah. All right. Any final thoughts before we get out of here? We, we've, uh, I think we've we said have it about gone all. through a gauntlet of topics here from the, my back up. the lonely Jeremy Bowler in my career to ancient aliens. I mean, uh, into America's shoe right here. That's got awesome. into some you, the things you wanted to talk about. This is great. Football. Fantasy football. Oh, Who's your biggest great. fantasy football rival? Who's the person you want to beat the most? Ooh, I, I, honestly, I, I know one, mine right now. I think now. mine's probably Tim Volk. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. v- he beating, is, beating Tim Volk. Tim He's, is the, uh, I don't know how to describe the correct words the way he likes to propose to you a trade. It's basically like, I'm giving you this. Like, you'd be dumb not to take yeah, this. Right. But if you don't want it, I'll just keep winning. I, I it, But it's a bad deal. He's the King you Joffrey know. of our He's fantasy. King Joffrey of Game of Thrones Game of, of Thrones. fantasy football. Great yeah, show. Him, I love beating him. Uh, I love beating Fuzzy. Ooh, okay. Chris, All right. Chris Franklin. But I, I think it's just because Fuzzy's not, it's not, it's not the, the rivalry that I had with Thomas Cappell. Okay, fair enough. A, 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 and I love that rivalry, and I do miss Thomas. But uh, we had a uh, – it was really fun. But anything that we did, we wanted to beat each other. And um, and then now I've kind of got a rivalry with Tim, too. I think we all do. I think we all do. Tim's but, a good villain of our league. Yeah, he's a villain. Uh, Fuzz isn't a villain, but when – he just gets so fired up sometimes. It's he does. just funny. Like, I've never – he's so calm, but then once in a while he'll just – and then we have our, our El Presidente, Chris Allen, who is definitely the shark tank of yeah. trading when it comes to yeah. taking steel right now. If you even go ask anybody else, it's off the table. You can't even negotiate. He, he didn't. I wanted to trade for Kelsey and Tariq Hill from him last year. He wouldn't do it, and I am so glad because I don't win if I don't have uh, George Kittle from the 49ers. That's right. So. That's right. All right, guys, look, uh, thank you for hanging out with us again. Um, This is Wild Pitches. Eris and I will continue to uh, bring you podcasts from the Smokies front office. And uh, I'm going to try to get Michael Ryan on here sometime soon. I'd love to have the Smokies manager, maybe some players, all that. But uh, thank you for hanging out. Make sure you like and subscribe to our channel. And go Smokies. We'll uh, see you at the ballpark.